Okay, let us go on. Here I collected the previous uh, results that we have just obtained. Uh, let's go through them just in one minute. So we first calculated in six dimensions the divergent part of the one-loop self-energy. The result was divergent. It's quadratically divergent, therefore the result contains explicitly Q square, which is the momentum here, times a numerical constant. And the numerical constant is given by this expression, a uh, normal uh, integral with the usual prefactors minus i square times 2 times the loop factor in six dimensions, 1 over 2 epsilon times a beta integral over a very simple integrand, and uh, that integral was actually 1 over 12. Then we needed to look at the insertion of that into the one-loop counterterm diagram. The difficulty was the momentum dependence here. We dealt with it using the u variables and the derivatives with respect to u. The result is then minus i cubed, oh, sorry, what is this? Minus i cubed times the d-dimensional loop factor times this numerical coefficient, which is this one times the remaining integral over Tg, beta 3, and beta 4. And the integrand is the usual 2 times the exponential of the appropriate diagram times this complicated factor, which arose from the derivative with respect to u. And it has these different terms involving different exponents of d tilde and Tg. Now to the two-loop diagram. The two-loop expression is again written here. It has minus i to the fifth, two loop factors, two to the square, the same integrations as here, uh, plus a t and beta integral. And the integrand contains tg to the appropriate power, plus four epsilon, because we have two loops. The inner variable t to that power, plus two epsilon, because it's a one loop subdiagram. Then the usual exponent, the WOG is given here again. It depends on T and TG in a complicated way. But if we put T to zero, it simplifies, as we discussed. Then DG tilde is given here. It also simplifies if we put T to zero. But that is a full two-loop result. Now let's extract the divergence coming from the T integration and combine it with the previous counterterm diagram. So let us extract the dt divergent part. That is our task. So if we look at the t integration, then the structure is integral dt times t to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon times a function g of t. And the function g of t is this product here of uh, the two functions. And of course, in general, we can apply our formula. This is 1 over 2 epsilon times the second derivative with respect to t at t equals 0 divided by 2 factorial plus something finite. And for the finite term, we have an explicit expression in terms of g of t minus the Taylor polynomial up to second order in t. So, and again, this uh, second derivative with respect to t at t equals 0, if the function actually depends only on t square, is simply given by 2 times the first derivative with respect to t square of that function at t equals 0. And then we can rather simply read off the appropriate derivatives. So the necessary derivatives are d with respect to t square of g directly at t equals 0 is now the following. So we get the full e to the i w g times d tilde g to the power minus 3 plus epsilon. We can always factor that out. And then we get one derivative with respect to t square from e, uh, the first factor. And then we get i times dwg with respect to t square at t square equals 0 plus the second term minus 3 plus epsilon 
times the derivative of this dg with respect to t square divided by dg tilde and everything evaluated at t equals zero. Okay, so if we do that, then we get at t equals zero. This, we have already seen it, reduces to the reduced ohm w, wg over h instead of wg. Because then here, the t terms cancel, the one plus beta cancels, and we have this simplification. Likewise, this also reduces to the product of the two simpler d's to the appropriate power. Then, in the bracket, what happens? The derivative of wg with respect to t square. That is now involving the quotient rule. So we get one term from the derivative in the numerator, which is beta divided by the rest, and one term from the denominator, which is then also beta divided by minus the denominator square. So we get, um, let's say, let's write it here, dwg, the derivative with respect to t square, is given by p square times dg square times first beta divided by one plus beta times uh, that here, and that is actually d tilde g over h. Then minus uh, one plus beta times beta three plus four times beta divided by the denominator here, one plus beta square times dg over h tilde square. And then we can simplify, so, p square tg square times beta divided by 1 plus beta and also here uh, 1 plus beta divided by 1 plus beta square times beta gives always this combination beta divided by 1 plus beta as a prefactor and then we have here uh, 1 divided by d tilde g over h minus beta 3 plus 4 divided by d tilde g over h square. If we bring it to one common denominator, d g tilde over h square, then we get here 1 plus beta 3 plus 4 minus beta 3 plus 4, so we have just 1 in the numerator. So that is our derivative. It actually can be written using our variable. This was called wh tilde before this combination. And that is d tilde g over h to the power minus two. So we get here this wh, which also appears at the top line in the divergence of our one loop diagram. Then what else do we need? D with respect to t square of d tilde g divided by d tilde tilde g evaluated at t equals zero. What is that? We need it here. So the derivative with respect to t square comes only from here and it is given by beta. So the numerator is just beta. Beta. And in the denominator we get the product of these two and uh, that is again one plus beta times the tilde g over h, and so we have again this wh tilde times d tilde g over h to the power minus one. So we have both terms that we need here, and uh, actually, let's factor out as much as possible, both terms involve our w tilde h, uh, both terms involve dg over h, but to different powers, so let's not factor that out. And, um, okay, so we cannot factor out more. So then we have i times p square times tg square from here times dg over h tilde to the power minus 2. 
That is what we obtain from here. And then from the second term, that prefactor is nothing but minus d over 2, minus d over 2 times this. We have factored out that one, so we have a remaining d tilde g over h to the power minus 1. So our derivative has simplified dramatically and we see uh, obviously that what emerges is perfect because here we see a similar structure as the structure that we have in our one loop counter term diagram. Here in the middle line we have also this combination of a p square term with some powers of d tilde and some powers of tg and a d over 2 term with some other powers of d tilde and tg. And of course, the powers and the prefactors match exactly. We can see it hopefully already here if we compare. That is i times the uh, round bracket over there. So if we multiply with i, then we have i times p square and minus times d over 2, and the other powers completely match. Therefore, we can immediately go back to our two-loop diagram and uh, already have the essential result. So this two-loop diagram and uh, from it the divergent part of the dt integral is given as follows. Minus i to the fifth power times loop factor cd square times 2 square times the divergence 1 over 2 epsilon, then times the remaining integral Tg beta 3 beta 4, and then also an integral over beta, but let's uh, write that down later, d e to the i w g over h. So I collect now all the factors, and uh, the factors are precisely what we have here in the line before. So let me combine it. Uh, that can be factored out, and then we have the round bracket in the identical form, i p square to the power, uh, but to combine it with the t coefficient, tg to the power minus 3 plus 4 epsilon, that gets now combined with this, and also we can combine those powers of tg, but I need more space, so let me uh, write it down in a different way. Um, times, so the integrand goes on, times, times the following round bracket, namely, first i t square times tg to the following power, square plus the other exponent, minus 1 plus 4 epsilon, the g over h tilde, to which power, minus 2, plus that power gives minus 5 plus epsilon. Then minus d over 2, minus d over 2 times tg to the power minus 3 plus 4 epsilon, because that comes just from above, and d tilde g over h to which power minus 3 plus epsilon minus 1 gives minus 4 plus epsilon. And then what remains is this, uh, the tilde h, and that depends on beta. So only now I introduce the integral over beta, and the integrand is d tilde h to the power minus 3 plus epsilon, and our w h tilde, which came from here, uh, from evaluating our derivatives. That's all. So this is our precise integrand of our two-loop diagram. And now we should look at it in this way. If we combine it like this, then we have now three results. Two-loop, one-loop counter term, and one loop counter term insertion. These three should be combined. So now we can discuss the sum of the two loop diagram plus the one loop counter term diagram 
where this gets inserted. And now we see again the same cancellation as what happened in four dimensions. So let us write down something for it, uh, but let's first look at it before I clean the blackboard. Again, the factors of minus i match minus i to the fifth, minus i to the fifth. Then loop factor cd square, then here in the combination cd times c6. The factors of 2, 2 square, and here 2 times 2. 1 over 2 epsilon matches the 1 over epsilon here. Then what remains is the integration over these three outer variables. We have that here as well. And the integrand is this function here at the two-loop level. And the integrand at the one-loop level is this times the insertion from here. So you see already the beta integral from here combines with the beta integral here. It's not the same, but almost. The difference is only the plus epsilon in the exponent. Everything else is the same. So we have uh, such a structure where we have a difference between two terms, and the difference is in the exponent plus epsilon. Then this prefactor is actually uh, I almost identical to this one. What is the difference? The factor i is OK. So this is i times that. But uh, uh, the i will drop out. And uh, otherwise, we have here the difference in the epsilons. Tg to the power 2 epsilon, Tg to the power 4 epsilon. Here, Tg minus 3 plus 4 epsilon, Tg to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon. So it almost matches again, but the difference is, is in the exponents of the epsilon. But otherwise, it perfectly matches. Let us search the factor of i. Where is the factor of i? OK, sorry for that. But uh, in writing this formula, I forgot to write the i. And now, including the i, it matches. Because then uh, the i gets multiplied with this prefactor. And then we have exactly the identical prefactor as in our two-loop calculation up to the factors of uh, 2 epsilon in some of the exponents. So let us clean the blackboard and discuss in words what all that means. OK, let us now discuss the cancellation after we have fixed the factor of i. Everything works out nicely. And we can look at the sum of the two-loop diagram plus the one-loop counterterm diagram with one-loop insertion. And from the two-loop, we take only the t divergent part. So we see again, uh, just without writing anything more, it is clear that the subdivergence cancels again. We have now, of course, a more complicated structure compared to four dimensions. We have, in particular, two terms. One term proportional to p square with this, these powers of t and d tilde, and another term with d over 2 with other powers of d tilde and t. And for each of them, we get the same kind of structure of cancellation. And the structure of cancellation is the same as what happened in four dimensions. Namely, we get a combination of terms where we have different exponents of the t variable, but the difference is uh, plus 2 epsilon in the exponents. And we also have different prefactors. And in the prefactors, they are regular 1 plus beta and, uh, or numerical factors like cd or c6. They differ by constants to the power epsilon. So these are the differences. And after we plug in these differences, each term has the following structure. Namely, an integral over Tg to some power, let's say minus uh, omega minus 1 and this omega so some terms have just minus 1 plus 2 epsilon or minus 1 plus 4 epsilon. 
Other terms have minus three plus two epsilon, so let me write in general just minus omega plus one, then plus two epsilon. And then we have an extra power of t to the tg to the power two epsilon in the two loop graph and extra prefactors, let's call them a to the power epsilon from the two loop graph. And this extra power comes from the loop factor in d dimensions versus loop factor in six dimensions and d tilde to the power um, here, uh, sorry, in the um, d tilde h to the power minus three plus epsilon instead of power minus three. This is this a divided by two epsilon and correspondingly in the counter term graph we have just minus one. So this is the difference that emerges if we uh, combine all these expressions, then we can factor out such a combination. The prefactor is a t integration with some exponent plus two epsilon times the remaining function f of all the variables including the variable tg. And this remaining function is then regular in Tg, continuous and differentiable also at T equals zero and exponentially damped for large T. Let's just write down before we forget it. So this A to the power epsilon can be Cd divided by C6 or D tilde H to the power epsilon and things like this. And then we don't have to say much more. We can evaluate the integrals over Tg as well. So if we look, for example, at the Tg to the power minus one plus two epsilon integral, then we, what we would get uh, in concrete terms is we can evaluate uh, the integral here using our formula. So in the four dimensional case, we had here Tg to the power plus one plus two epsilon, and that was a completely finite integral. Then Tg to the power plus one times that times a regular function of T gave an absolutely finite integral. This is of course analytic in epsilon, also at epsilon equal to zero, and it behaves at least uh, at most logarithmically in T times T to the power one is finite. Now, however, it is not finite. The Tg integral is now divergent because our two loop integral has a superficial degree of divergence plus two. So we expect that. So we have to apply our formula again for this Tg integral. And when we apply our formula, it's a little bit complicated. We have to apply our formula once for this term, then we get this two, uh, four epsilon overall. So we get the divergence one over four epsilon. And from here, we get a divergence one over two epsilon, and each time times uh, f evaluated at zero or derivatives of f evaluated at zero. So let us look at the structure, what happens if we take the term we have, where we have Tg to the power minus one. Then we would uh, apply our formula and we would just get f at zero, no derivatives. So here we would get one over two epsilon. This is the one over two epsilon which appears explicitly. Then curly bracket and in the curly bracket we get once one over four epsilon from the first term um, times a to the power epsilon times f of zero minus the second term which is one over two epsilon um, times one times f of zero. And uh, that is the divergent part of the integration using our formula. And then comes uh, the finite remainder. Finite remainder means finite in terms of our formula. So that means we have one over two epsilon from the explicit one over epsilon times an integral Tg to the power minus one plus two epsilon times all of the curly bracket that remains what, okay, this curly bracket contains the one over two epsilon and uh, this thing in the numerator and then we have f of t 
minus theta function of 1 minus t times f of 0. So that was our explicit formula for the regular part of the integral. And now you see this integral here, if you integrate over tg, then it is finite in terms of the tg integration. The 1 over 2 epsilon remains as a prefactor, but the tg integral is now regular because at small tg, this behaves like order t, cancels the 1 over tg, and what remains is an integrable integrand of tg, and we can get a finite result. And, uh, right, and this is even true if we take the limit epsilon going to zero, because then the 1 over 2 epsilon combines with the numerator to give at most logarithm of tg, which is still integrable combined with the other integrands. Therefore, we get a finite result. So this is finite for epsilon going to zero. Therefore, it is an important contribution to the final physical result, but it contains no divergence anymore. But this is, of course, divergent. This is the divergent part. And now you see here what happens. The 1 over 2 epsilon here at the front came from the subdivergence of the inner one loop diagram. This gives this explicit 1 over 2 epsilon. And then these two terms, which came from the curly bracket, they do not cancel. They give a final result which contains still 1 over epsilon. So because for epsilon going to 0, uh, this a goes to 1, and then we simply get 1 over 4 epsilon minus 1 over 2 epsilon, which is of course not 0. So we get an additional 1 over epsilon from here. Therefore, overall, in uh, this first expression, we have 1 over epsilon square divergences and 1 over epsilon divergences as we know from our explicit calculation. But what is the prefactor of all these uh, 1 over epsilon and 1 over epsilon square poles? The prefactor can only come from f of 0. And what is f of 0? f of 0 is the integrand evaluated at t equals 0. And the question is, how does this depend on the momentum of the Feynman diagram? And the answer is, the momentum appears only just as an explicit prefactor p square. Therefore, this f of 0 is a polynomial of second degree in p. It's just p square. If we set t to 0, then all the exponents vanish, and there is no other p square dependence at all. Therefore, times coefficients, uh, which are proportional to p square, or in general, polynomials in the external momentum of the degree equal to power counting. Let's just go on here. What would happen in the more complicated case where we have Tg to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon? Of course, now it blows up, but the structure is the same. We have to look here. This is our integral, but now replace this by minus 3 plus 2 epsilon. The rest is what it is here. Then we have to apply our formula. That means, since we have here minus 3, we need to take the second derivative of the function f. So the structure is otherwise the same. So we get similar, but the second derivative f double prime with respect to tg at tg equals 0 appears. But everything else is the same. So we get some function which behaves like this, f of tg minus the second Taylor polynomial, then combining it with tg to the minus 3 gives a regular integral which is completely finite and analytic in the limit epsilon going to 0. Then we have here a prefactor containing f double prime at 0 times such poles 
So we get again one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles, but the coefficients are determined by the second derivative of f at uh, t equals zero, and that again contains p square only in polynomial form, because it can always only arise from the exponents. They contain p in polynomial form. If we take the derivative, we get the polynomial in front, set t to zero, then the exponents become zero as well. So again, one over epsilon square and one over epsilon poles. Coefficients are equal to polynomials in P of degree omega g, which is 2 here. And the remainder. which came from the finite part of our inner t integral. Where was it? Um, so this is only the divergent part of the t integral and the finite part of the inner t integral. We have also written down a sketchy formula uh, that gives a finite integrand over tg. And uh, so the remainder is finite. Uh, finite sorry, finite as a function of t, and then we have the t3 integration, and the t3 integration over a finite integrand just behaves again like this. So uh, something like this doesn't appear. We just have an integrand with such a prefactor and an integrand which depends on g, t3. Whatever the exponent is here, we get either as in the result a divergence proportional to f of zero or to some derivative of f at zero, that means, again, the coefficient of the 1 over epsilon pole resulting from the remaining integral is also a polynomial. Finite plus 1 over epsilon poles. Um, and it can only be 1 over epsilon because 1t integration can only give 1 over epsilon uh, times coefficients, which are also polynomials of degree omega g. So that is our structure of the cancellation. And let me finish by writing down the lessons that you should take home from our discussion today. So again, the subdivergence cancels, which means in particular, as we see here explicitly, the non-polynomial divergences cancel, non-polynomial in P mu divergences cancel. As a technique, we have discovered a new formalism namely this formalism using the u variables and in this formalism if we have an insertion of divergent part of some one loop diagram which is proportional to q square inserted into a counter term diagram like this one then we can do the alpha parametrization including these u variables and q mu becomes minus i derivative with respect to u mu. That is the replacement rule. And along with that, we need to have a modified w in the exponent. Then we saw one detail derivative with respect to u mu of u mu contracted over all the Lorentz indices must give the metric in d dimensions, which is d 
and not equal to 6 or not equal to 4, but really equal to 6 minus 2 epsilon, because that corresponds to uh, our d-dimensional momentum in the numerator and in the denominator. First of all, this simplifies the calculation in momentum space, and second, uh, this appearance of d in both places, both in the two-loop diagram and in the one-loop diagram here, means that those terms cancel. At least on this level, we, uh, if we would have at one place 6 in the other place d, we would have an extra term of this form here, a to the epsilon, coming from this mismatch, d versus d0. And uh, we had, would have to keep track of this difference. But uh, we can trace uh, what this leads to later. And um, this is actually really a useful prescription in dimensional regularization without which the regularization might become inconsistent. Then what else did we see here on the right? We have again such relations as we had also in the four-dimensional case. So all of what is here in this box is relationships between the two-loop W and the two-loop D tilde. If we take derivatives, it simplifies in terms of one-loop expressions. If we put T to zero, it simplifies to products of one-loop expressions in both cases. And these relations are, of course, necessary in order to extract um, and make manifest the cancellation. So relations between, let's say, the t square in this case of wg is related to the reduced w and to the one loop w and similar relationships for the d tildes. And all of that is, of course, necessary. And then the cancellation happens in terms of those functions in the curly brackets. Of the form t, let's just generically say, t to the power 2 epsilon times a constant to the power epsilon minus 1, divided by 2 epsilon. These are functions which appear as the prefactor in our cancellation expressions. And so this is what one has to deal with. That means for our later discussions and for general proofs, one should generalize all of this. One will have to set up a general formalism of U, which one can do in all diagrams, arbitrarily complicated. Then uh, write down always an insertion of a subdiagram into a counterterm diagram in such a way where the momenta are replaced by appropriate derivatives with respect to u. We will always have to determine such relationships between a multi-loop diagram where we might take derivatives or uh, set t to zero in certain expressions. And then this will simplify to combinations of lower loop expressions. And we have to discuss the properties of such functions, maybe uh, even gen more general types of functions with similar properties appear, and they have to be studied as well. And if you combine all these elements, then uh, one can set up a general proof of um, the fact that if you take a multi-loop diagram, add all the appropriate sub-loop counter terms, then the overall result might have still 1 over epsilon poles, but the coefficients are polynomial in the external momenta of the multi-loop diagram so that one can subtract them also using overall counter terms. And then the whole thing is consistent in terms of quantum field theory because all these subtractions here correspond to counter term Lagrangians which can be interpreted um, and are consistent with relativistic quantum field theory. And then one can really show that using this formalism to all orders in perturbation theory, the quantum field theory is well defined and consistent with fundamental properties like causality and relativistic invariance. Okay, that ends the lecture for today. And uh, the next time we will sketch at least this more general proof.